Going back to your use of the Gordons as an example, it's interesting because it, when I first started this whole thing, because today everything is presented as a clan. You go on Wikipedia and you dial in clan and then just insert a Scottish last name and they've got a Wikipedia article on that group as a clan. And when I was writing my master's, master's thesis, which is when I first reached out to you, I couldn't, I couldn't find a lot of sources. And part of it is I just didn't know how to dig well enough because I was doing it all online. So I didn't have a nice big university with chuck full of books that I could go read. And that was, I, as I read a lot of these, you know, for starters, just to get a, the foundation, these Wikipedia articles. And I was like, it looks like they're just describing an aristocratic family. They're not mentioning any broader kin group. There doesn't look like there's this bigger kin group that has somebody they acknowledge as the head of the kin group that they follow. There's not a bunch of different branches of it. There's nothing that we can see them coming together based on either real or perceived kinship. Nothing that looks like a clan, but in that process, I had to try to like, well, what is a clan? And I was, that's those things I just mentioned is kind of how I boiled it down. There's, it's bigger than just a guy and his family. They, they've got a head, this big group has a head who not only they acknowledge as a, as a head, but he sees himself as their leader. And you can see them coming together for some cooperative effort based on that kinship. Um, you, unfortunately, that's usually warfare. <laughs> it's usually violence is, I think, maybe the most visible in the historical record. What, what, would you, what would you add to that to help us understand, like, as we're looking like, was this group really a clan or are we just talking about an aristocratic family? Yeah, and, and that's where it does, it is really blurry. I mean, if you look at how the elite of clan societies, so Highland chiefs and, and their families operate, it's very similar to lowland nobility. You know, um, it's, it's complicated then after in the 19th century when the Highlands become romanticized and suddenly everybody wants to wear tartan as if clans had always worn tartan and everybody wants to be a clan. Um, so, but you're right about that cooperation. And I think that's what boils down to is, and I think what I've tried to argue is that for me at the heart of clanship is this reciprocal relationship. Um, I, I think too often we present it as a hierarchical relationship that the chief is at the top and he is the guy that calls all the shots. And to some extent he is, but that's based on the reciprocal understanding that, that yes, um, he can expect loyalty and obedience and faithful service from his clan, but he has to protect, provide and administer justice for his people. And if you don't do that, you are, you can be removed. And there have been instances where, where clan chiefs are removed. Um, so, to me, it's not an easy job being a clan chief. Okay, you have a lot of complex things going on, not just within your own clan. So you hold the land that your clan live on and you work it together, you farm it together. Um, and in times of harvest, failure or dearth, it's then your responsibility to provide when, you know, most of the time you are redistributing resources around your clan. But if there's a harvest failure, if there's a famine, and that was often the case in the 16th, 17th century, then what do you do? Because that's your responsibility. In times of warfare, you have to protect your land from attack. Um, when one of your clan members has been attacked, then you have to provide justice. That's a There's a lot going on there. You're not just sorting out marriages for people or, you know, trading with somebody, which you're, you're also doing. You're forming external alliances to, to create a network of, of allies to protect your land from other people. It's it's an ongoing thing and it's constantly evolving. This sense that clans are just stuck in one place for centuries. Yeah. And they're constantly growing, growing and also contracting at times because, you know, clans rise and fall like other lone families. But And so it is that, that cooperation that as a clan chief, you're, you're responsible for that. Um, and that's a hard gig. And that's what I think ties back to what you said about the, the reputation for violence. There is, okay, um, there is a militaristic aspect to clan society. But I think too often on the part of the crown is a misunderstanding where some of that violence comes from. And it comes from economic need. Because if you're a clan chief and you, your cattle have been stolen or there's been a harvest failure, you don't have any grain, you don't have the cash to go to the lowlands to buy more and not enough. So the only way you can recoup your loss is to take it from somebody else. So then you start a cycle of tit for tat, raiding, stealing, because that's the way you survive. And that's, that's, and so that's that association of, well, the Highlanders, they just take each other's cattle and they're always fighting. 
to me, a lot of the time, that's not their natural status quo. That's not what they want because warfare leads to destruction of land and land is your basic economic resource. Yeah. Yeah. No, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not an easy gig, I think, being a clan chief. <laughs> that's a really, I think a really, uh, that's something that, how hard it would be to be a clan chief. I think that's not something I've given a lot of attention to. But you you do in kinship and clientage really outline that very well. I think with um, the the different things that he was responsible for, and they would allow him to lead the clan in as much as he was good at that. And there were examples of people where the clan found somebody else who was better at it. <laughs>